Best-selling author Tim LaHaye writes, almost everyone who has heard of Jesus has developed an opinion about him. That is to be expected, for he is not only the most famous person in world history, but also the most controversial. The writers of scripture invite us to examine this person Jesus for ourselves and to conclude for ourselves his significance. We cannot focus the investigation just on his teaching or works. First and foremost, we must focus the investigation on his identity. Matthew is the gospel which was written for the Jews. It was written by a Jew in order to convince Jews. Did you know that? Matthew's gospel was written to try to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. One of the main objectives of the book of Matthew is to demonstrate that all the prophecies of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Jesus, and that therefore he must be the Messiah. It has one phrase which runs through it like an ever-recurring theme. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. So you'll see that time and again. Something will happen in the life of Jesus as recorded for history. And then the writer will say, so this happened, and this fulfilled a prophecy from the Old Testament. Time and time and time again. A few examples are... Uh, the flight to Egypt. Remember, Herod wanted to try to kill the coming Messiah, so he slaughtered all the innocents in the city of Bethlehem under the age of two. But they, so Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus had to flee to Egypt. So the slaughter of the children was also predicted. Joseph's settlement in Nazareth was predicted. And Jesus' upbringing there Jesus' use of parables, the triumphal entry, the betrayal for 30 pieces of silver, and the casting of lots for Jesus' garments as he hung on the cross. It is Matthew's primary and deliberate purpose to show how the Old Testament prophecies received their fulfillment in Jesus, how every detail of Jesus' life was foreshadowed in the prophets, and thus to compel the Jews to admit that Jesus was and is the Messiah. In addition, Matthew has an especially strong interest in all that Jesus said about his own second coming, about the end of the world, and about the judgment at the end of the world. Matthew 24 gives us a fuller account of Jesus' apocalyptic discourse than any of the other Gospels. Matthew alone has the parable of the talents, the wise and the foolish virgins, and the sheep and the goats. Matthew has a special interest in the last things and in judgment. So that's Matthew. Another eyewitness was the physician and historian Luke. Luke was a doctor. You often call him Dr. Luke. <clears throat> Who authored both the gospel bearing his name, the gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts was written by Luke as well. These two books together constitute about one quarter of the entire New Testament. Consequently, a critical issue is whether Luke was a historian who could be trusted to get things right. When archaeologists check out the details of what Luke wrote, do they find that he was careful or sloppy? The general consensus of both liberal and conservative scholars is that Luke is very accurate as a historian. He writes as an educated man, and archaeological discoveries are showing over and over again that Luke is accurate in what he has to say. So archaeology has again and again and again and again confirmed the Bible and confirmed the accounts of Luke and Matthew as factual. Archaeology may support the credibility of Luke, but what about Matthew? Matthew as well is often confirmed by archaeology. Okay? Okay. So, when everything is put into the appropriate context, I think we see that the Gospels are in fact quite accurate in their depiction of Jesus' life. They match archaeology and history of the time. They match sources of history outside the Bible, like the historian Josephus, 
or Tacitus, another ancient historian, and other historians who were not, who had no agenda, who simply were recording history, and we see these accounts again and again and again match what the scriptures say, and say, yes, there was a Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, he really lived. Yes, he really died on a cross. Yes, his tomb was really empty. So archaeology, um, and I just like to give a few examples of archaeology. You guys understand archaeology? The, the, the digging and discovery of artifacts from the past. That's archaeology. I'd like to share a few discoveries that have been made that have, have confirmed the Bible, particularly the New Testament. Related to Pontius Pilate, for many years the only corroboration we had for the existence of Pontius Pilate was a very brief citation by Tacitus, the, the historian who mentions briefly that Pontius Pilate was a governor during the time period of Jesus' life. In 1961, however, a piece of limestone was discovered bearing an inscription with Pilate's name on it. The inscription was discovered in Caesarea, a provincial capital during Pilate's time, about AD 26 to 36, right around there. And it describes a building dedicated uh, from Pilate to Tiberius Caesar. So this limestone inscription says, you know, I, Pontius Pilate, dedicate this facility to Tiberius Caesar. So it proves that, yes, indeed, there was a Pontius Pilate at the, who lived at the same time of Jesus. Also, another example, 10 synagogues have been unearthed in Israel. To date, the remains of 10 synagogues dating before A.D. 70 have been unearthed in Israel, including at Capernaum, Gamla, the Herodium, Jericho, Magdala, Masada, Moedin, Kurat Sefer, Beth Shemesh, and Hayat Tuani. And when, when there's a distinct Magdala, probably where Mary Magdalene uh, grew up was Magdala. In addition to the remains of actual synagogue structures, there is the famous Theotis inscription, which states that Theotis built a synagogue in Jerusalem for the, quote, reading of the Torah and teaching of the commandments. Another example, in 2004, the Pool of Siloam from the first century was accidentally discovered during repairs to a drainage system. So they're repairing a drainage system and they discover underneath the Pool of Siloam from the time of Jesus. Interesting. Archaeologists Eli Shukran and Ronnie Reich were called in to excavate and unearthed a large pool that had at least 20 steps leading down from the street level into the pool. Pottery from one end of the pool was used to date it to the first century AD. Given that it was in the exact location that scholars had long believed the actual Pool of Siloam to be, only 70 meters from the Byzantian pool, and that it dated to the time of Jesus, it was identified as the actual pool of Siloam, where the blind men had washed to receive healing from Jesus. All these facts point us to the truth that we can believe the Bible. As much hate and anti-Bible stuff is out there, and there's a ton of it, I mean, people have tried so hard to refute the Bible, and archaeology just keeps confirming it over and over and over. And they just can't take out the Bible. They've tried. Some of the greatest atheists have tried to take out the Bible, prove that it's not true, and they just keep failing. Because it is true. It's true. It's God's word. We can, we can trust what it says. All this points us to the fact that in the Gospel of Matthew, we can trust that the claims he makes are true about a Jesus being born. But I do want to focus in on one scripture from Matthew chapter 2. We're in our Christmas series, so I thought we should talk a little bit about how the birth of Jesus uh, came to we, we, we mentioned this briefly at Morning Church, but I do want to get into this because it just, it re, it's so interesting. It says this, uh, from Matthew chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. They were like engaged. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, 
he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So check this out. Okay. Mary has been made pregnant by the Holy Spirit, the virgin birth of Jesus, right? That there was no man involved. So it's one of the critical truths about the life of Jesus that he was born miraculously. And what does Joseph do when he finds out his the lady, he's, his fiance, is pregnant? He says, yeah, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm breaking this off. <laughs> you obviously cheated on me. Does that sound like a myth? That sounds like real life right there. That sounds like real life. Does that sound like a myth? No. He says, I'm, I'm divorcing you. And listen, I might do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> listen, if, you're, if you're, you know, your fiance comes to you and says, listen, I'm pregnant, but it's, it, listen, there was no man. I mean, really? Can you explain that? Never mind, I don't even want to hear the explanation. You know, because listen, it, that's what someone would do, right? But check this out. God will do unexpected things in our lives. That's my first point today. Joseph is shocked to find out Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And his first reaction is he is mad. And he begins thinking, well, he's thinking in his mind, I'm going to divorce Mary. There's nothing I can do. I'm going to do it quietly so maybe she doesn't get into trouble, right? In the city. And Joseph would have done just that, except that God would intervene again. In verses 20 and 21, but after he had considered this, so he's thinking about it, he's, he's probably laying there upset, miserable, like, I was going to marry Mary, Mary's going to be the, the, my true love, and now i got to divorce her. This is awful. He's probably in tears. And he falls, he probably cries himself to sleep here. He's so upset. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived is her, in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So the only reason Joseph decides to go through with it is he has this crazy dream where he sees an angel who tells him, hey, what she's telling you is true. Okay, she's not had an affair. This is for real. And you're going to name your son Jesus. Point number two. What appears to be a disaster is actually a blessing. This appears to be a disaster for Joseph in his life. He is, it is done. His dream is dead. He's probably working on their house and thinking, well, it's over. But the disaster turns into a blessing. There are many times in our lives, friends, where we're obeying God and it looks like a disaster. But as he walks us through it, it turns into a blessing in disguise. I want you to think about Esther, the book of Esther from the Old Testament. It looked like a disaster that uh, Haman was gonna, it was hatching this plot against the Jews to extinguish her people from the country. But God ended up using that situation to, to grant the Jews their greatest victory over their enemies. But she, she had to walk through the fire first, right? But that wicked scheme was turned to a blessing. So if you're going through a dark time right now, if you're honoring God through it, he may just turn it from a disaster to a blessing. Not always. Sometimes there's just a tragedy, you know? Sometimes there's bad things that happen in life. But many times if we're honoring God through a trial, at the other end comes a blessing. Does that make sense? Now, if you're, if you're in a tough time because you made dumb decisions, that's different. Okay? That is, well, you, you messed up and you're facing the consequences of your own bad ideas. But if it is from God and you're honoring God, you're doing the right things and you're still facing problems, keep going. Because you may find a blessing at the other end of that struggle. Okay. Then in verses 22 to 25... All this took place to fulfill, uh, here's Matthew saying, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. We just talked about that, didn't we? That the Old Testament 
is, is all pointing these prophecies toward the coming of Jesus. And Matthew is going to keep pointing back to the Old Testament for the reader saying, this was prophesied, this was predicted, this was predicted by Micah, this was predicted by Isaiah, this was predicted by another prophet. It's all lining up to fit the puzzle pieces of this is the Christ, this is the Messiah. So the Lord said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he's like, wow, he wakes up. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. So he has that dream, and he obeys. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So... For you Catholics or lapsed Catholics out there, I have to disprove the, the, the idea that Mary is a perpetual virgin. Um, it says right here that Joseph did consummate their marriage after Jesus was born. It says it right there. Um, I don't know what to do with it except to say that's what it says. <laughs> and he gave him the name Jesus, okay? Third point. Mary and Joseph both obey what God has told them, and things work out just as they should. Listen, if you want the secret to living a, a, a successful life, here it is. Find out what God wants you to do, and then do it. Whoa. What? Yeah. Find out what God wants you to do, and then do it. Is that complicated? Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, maybe it is in a way, yeah, a little bit. Maybe it is in some way. Right, yeah. So it is, it's, it's, it's studying his word, praying, and then discovering what he wants us to do. Yeah, that is, that's not, that's not simple, but it is doable. Right. So, and, and if, you're, if you're careful to let God guide your life, your life will turn out just as it should. You will walk in the will of God, and it will be... A beautiful thing. It may be a beautiful mess, but it will be a beautiful mess. So, beautiful, beautiful mess, so be it. It won't be easy always, but it will be blessed. So, it all happens just as it was supposed to. Mary carried Jesus in her belly. Joseph didn't divorce Mary, but stayed with her and cared for her and the baby. And the baby was born, Messiah, just as God intended. And if if you're following God's will, things are going to work out as they should. You notice, though, that God had to intervene in different, in different ways and tell them what to do, right? Here's what you do. And God will do that for you as well. It may not be a voice from heaven saying, yes, this is God. <laughs> I'd like you to work at Taco Bell for a while. No, probably not. Maybe. Uh, stranger things have happened. Yeah, it would be easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be easier. And sometimes I wish that he would, but oftentimes I'll be reading the Bible or praying and it just comes to me. This is what I need to do next. You know? So he will reveal it as we seek him. So that is uh, the struggle, friends to simply seek to obey God as simply as Mary and Joseph did. Simply do what God wants. And then things work out. They aren't easy. In fact, right when Mary's pregnant, a census gets called, so they got to travel 80 miles while Mary is pregnant to their hometown of Bethlehem to register there. So it's a, in, in a census during this time, you had to return to the town of your origin to register. So kind of stressful. I mean, if they called a census right now and you had to go to your hometown, where would you go? Probably some of you might have to go kind of far. Maybe some of you would be right here in Owasso, but in any, in any case, it's not always, it's not always uh, easy. Sometimes you're going to have to go 80 miles with a pregnant woman on the back of a donkey. And I'll tell you, as a Christian, it's not always easy. Can I get an amen from some Christians out there? Is it always easy? No, it's tough sometimes, but it is quite doable. And he helps us every step of the way. So all this, the evidence 
that we went over points us to the fact that we can trust the account we just read, that we can consider it this really did happen, and consider it then Jesus must really be a living Savior who died on the cross and rose from the grave, who can be my Savior today if I will let him. If I'll put my life in his hands, he will be my Savior today and each day forward as I submit to him and follow his way. Okay? And we know then, at the conclusion of history, that Jesus will return. At the conclusion, at the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus returns to the earth to defeat evil, defeat the Antichrist, defeat Satan and the demons, and then to set up a new kingdom. That's the, that's the moment I'm waiting for when Jesus returns to set up the new heavens and new earth. And it's all in the book of Revelation. If you flip to the back of the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, you can read all about him, and it's pretty darn cool if you ask me. So Jesus came once as a savior, a humble servant. I mean, he came, and it was, it, it, it probably would not have made the news. It would not have made CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, PBS, or NPR. Because um, our world doesn't care about that. Jesus was born in a manger, a stable. But I'll tell you, when Jesus returns, it'll be very different. Every eye will see. And every knee is going to hit the floor and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Even the village atheist. Boom. And that is the coming hope for the Christian. It is a coming disaster for the atheist, the non-believer. But the, the option to give your life to him is open now. So take it. Because he will return the way he left. Like it says in Acts 1, 10 and 11, they were looking intent. This is when Jesus rose from the dead. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Whoa. So you're telling me, well, I'm telling myself, well, I'm telling you, uh, Jesus will return in the sky. Whoa. Can you imagine that? Out of the sky. <laughs> What's that? And he'll be fully grown because he has the way he left. Right, so exactly. Be he won't be a baby again, no. <laughs> baby falling from the sky. Right, well, that's what I mean. It's kind of... <laughs> yes. Right, yeah. Fully grown. Male adult Jesus, Savior of the world, King of Kings, to rule and reign. And at this culmination of Revelation, you have the Antichrist and his army of 200 million soldiers. You know how Jesus defeats them? Speaks. That's it. it says, You're done. <laughs> Over. So, Advent, here we are. Advent expresses a hope that God. Who at times can seem distant. Can anyone does some does it sometimes feel God is distant or far away? It sometimes feels that way. I get that. We don't see him face to face right now. We, we can sense his presence. We can feel his love, even his anger at times, uh, even his frustration with us, maybe if we're off track. But his love for us, his kindness, his gentleness, his mercy, his grace, we sense it. We don't see him with our eyes, but one day we will. <laughs> And it seems distant, but anticipation. We long for a ruling king who will bring truth and justice and righteousness into the world. I know I do. Matthew wrote about all this 2,000 years ago. I'm sure he was sitting there writing, I gotta, I gotta record what, what I saw, all that Jesus did. I saw him go up into the sky. I gotta record this so other people know about it. And we read his very words tonight. Matthew wrote down 2,000 years ago saying, i got to write down what I saw. Everyone's got to hear about this. Thank, thank you, Jesus.
And he had people write this down because I gotta know about it. And I got a savior now. So Advent becomes a time of celebration, a time of expectation, anticipation that Jesus is coming again, I think. Thus all of creation seems to cry out, Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. Come and be the king of the earth once again. Because it's a mess down here. And we need a perfect prince of peace on the earth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God. Thank you that you came. Lord Jesus, you came. And you made it clear to Matthew, to Luke, to so many others, God, that you are the one. You are the Christ, the Messiah. Lord Jesus, we make room in our hearts tonight for all that you did. Lord Jesus, be our Savior tonight. We recommit our lives to you tonight. We put ourselves in your hands. Lord Jesus, forgive our sins afresh. Any new sins we've committed, God, forgive those too. We turn to you and we turn our backs on sin. We put our, hand, our, our, our lives in your hands, Lord Jesus. Be our Savior, Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name.